So the theme tonight is disasters and disaster resilience. Disasters from beyond and disasters from within. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to lay down the groundwork for the rest of my esteemed colleagues tonight and talk about what we do as humans in the face of disasters we encounter and perhaps the disasters that we initiate. I can't get this to move, there we go. Behold the Demiurge. Mythical creature from Neo-Pythagorean Gnostic philosophy. Creator of all in the universe. But as we create, it's not just a question of creating those things that are bright, illuminatory, wonderful, that give us light, warmth, knowledge. The same power of creation holds with it the possibility for dystopia. The Demiurge was worshipped, adored, and feared. Because in the power of creation also lies the power of destruction. Creating the universe means not only creating the light, it means equally creating the darkness, the cold, and the fearful. In many ways, the Demiurge embodies all that we as humans throughout our anthropological history have feared. In many ways, that same fear has brought us together. It's allowed us to look upon ourselves when we were first able to stand upright and recognize with some self of self-sentience that indeed we had biological capabilities. Yet at the same time, we recognized and very often fell victim to our biological limitations. Look around the room, folks. Nobody in this room, anthropologically or through your own history, was born pooping through feathers, sucking oxygen out of water, running 40 miles an hour, climbing trees, or having huge fangs to take down prey. We were prey. And as a consequence of the thing that developed beneath our cranial vault, opposing thumbs and an ever more expansive linguistic capability, we recognized that we did real well in compensating for our biological limitations by maximizing our biological strengths. And in so doing, we recognized that we also did not work well alone. We worked best in a group. We worked best when we harnessed the power of that which we had and compensated for that which we lacked by engaging with others in increasingly complex dynamical networks of our psychosocial realities. And in so doing, we also adapted to tool use. We were not alone in our ecology. There are a number of other species that do this rather well. But I'd like to think that in many ways, we harness the power of that thing, that gray stuff that lurks beneath our hair or not, to create the great stuff that was, in fact, considered to be biosoma. And here with a deep and honorific nod to the late George Bullarello from New York Academy of Sciences and New York Polytechnic Institute, I offer to you the term biosoma, the dynamical interaction of human biology our social engagement, and our use of tools, qua machines. Increasingly more sophisticated use of our industriousness, our industriality, and ultimately our technology, to understand the nature and nerve of our universe, to understand those things that go bump in our biology and in the night. And so as not only to understand them so as to assuage our fears, but to understand so that we may control. And by control and understanding, we may then indeed optimize our flourishing, our strivings for what we consider to be good. But then we must ask, how do we define the good? Who's good? What rationality? Who's justice? And how then do we engage the artifacts of both our intellect and our creativity and our innovation in those ways that we may define to be good that may have heinous effects on those around us. Recall the Demiurge. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, science and technology is capable of doing wonderful things. Science as scientia, knowledge, allows us to gain insight to the natural world. It allows us to position ourselves against the human predicament of pain, suffering, disease, and our own finitude. It allows us to harness nature in many ways, access nature in others, but in our control of nature, it also allows us to engage those parts of our nature 
and very often can escape our own control. Look before you on the screen. The images graphically, although rather simplistically, depict the tremendous healing and helping power of science and its artifacts and technology, and through the very same coin, the very same blade, provides us purchase and leverage to define good in ways that harm others, and in so doing, offer great harm to ourselves. In so many ways, what we see is that science and technology cannot be extricated from the fact that these are human endeavors. And as human endeavors employed within the human condition lie vulnerable to all of those frailties of human nature, hubris, pride, aggression, violence, fear. Oh yes, look around the room. The very same things that we may say are many of our biological and psychosocial attributes can also be leveraged in a variety of ways through the same set of knowledge and tools to be great burdens, risks, and harms. It's that heuristics, it's that striving for new knowledge, the tools of that knowledge implemented as instruments and artifacts to develop ever more sophisticated tools that then allow us to probe ever deeper into the knowledge of the world, the universe, ourselves, that creates the power of what are sometimes referred to as Gigerenzer heuristics, the so-called after Gerd Gigerenzer, my colleague in Germany, who recognized that human history has been punctuated by the interaction of strivings for knowledge, and from that knowledge, the creation of instruments, artifacts, tools, techniques, and technologies that employ said knowledge, not only in understanding, but in control to leverage the human condition in ways that we define to be flourishing. We must also appreciate the limits of both knowledge and our understanding of the tools that we create of ourselves as tools creators. Indeed, if we look at the 20th century, we can see that this in many ways is the apex and at the same time the nadir of scientific and technological progression and development. Today, in this very room, in this very building, as the recipiency of advances in funding in science, technology, innovation, engineering, to engage those artifacts towards the human condition, to lessen the human predicament, and recognize what we are, what we are not, what we have and what we lack. Indeed, we're pushing the envelope of our capability ever farther and ever more severely. We must recognize, however, that those conditions at the boundaries represent that the status quo is progress. The conditions at the boundaries are always going to be unstable because they are the balancing act of what is known and what is unknown and what may in fact be unknowable, both about which we will discover and what we will control and perhaps ultimately about ourselves when we encounter such things. Whether it's an individual running into the room, one of our own gone mad natural disasters, or a good firm look at ourselves and ask why, why not, how and what we do with that. Indeed, as we press the boundaries further, we encounter not only the runaway effects, the science and technologies that we may create and let loose, but also what are referred to as Vexelblatt effects, the unanticipated consequences of our interaction with control, disruption, and manipulation of nature, for that which exists beyond and that which exists within. Indeed, what we find is contemporary science and technology has pushed forward not only the envelope but the pendulum of its own momentum, the translational milieu and that translational temporality that goes from concept to actualizable construct in all of the context of the human condition has been compressed over the past hundred years, from 35 years to five years. From idea pad to drawing board to reality, five years in part because of the convergence and de-siloing of many fields of the physical, natural sciences, physics, genoscience, nanoscience, environmental science, as we hear tonight, and evermore what we see as the final frontier, looking inside and saying, what is it? Not in a Cartesian way, I think, therefore I am, but what am I, and what makes me think, and what are others, and can we, in fact, as creators and perhaps destroyers, affect those things, that think and make new things that think. And what will we do with that? 
This positions us squarely as we move into the 21st century, not just as Homo sapiens, but as Homo sapiens biotechnicus. Indeed, it is we who determine and affect our nature and appreciate, engage, acknowledge, and control nature. But can we really appreciate, apprehend, and acknowledge not only our nature, but nature and what that will do to our nature? How then, given this intersection of the knowns, unknowns, certainties and uncertainties of what we are, of what we know, what we may create, can we go forward? I pose to you in the spirit of both potential disaster and resilience, a tentative or putative way forward, a trajectory that may be harnessable. In so doing, I say let's go back to the future. Let's re-examine the term technology in its most explicit means. Techne logos. A rational accounting of tools, tool use, and nonetheless, those who develop, engage, and use such tools, ourselves. What shall we make? What shall we be? Perhaps then the way forward, the way down the proverbial rabbit hole, was the same as prescribed by Lewis Carroll to his dear Alice. We must look into and through the looking glass. And that looking glass is both, at the same time, concomitantly, a lens to look at the objective realities of nature, the world, biological beings, and then turn it around to become a mirror to look upon ourselves and all of our biological, psychosocial, cultural, hubris and humility strengths, limitations, weaknesses, and flaws. What that mirror prompts us to do is to not act blindly with our heads down to those things we may create as artifacts, instruments, and tools in our understanding, our creation, and manipulation of ourselves and the world around us. Not to act, as Hannah Arendt said, as in what is considered to be animal laborance, slaving away in an animalistic way that does not take reason, that does not take reference of what it creates and what it becomes. But instead, to act as homo faber, to act instead, perhaps, as homo biotechnologicus, to take a rational accounting and recognize ourselves as homo sapiens and the power that such sapiens provides. Indeed, I offer you as a potential rescue boat towards the future of this bouncing ocean of uncertainty upon which we find ourselves, and that perhaps the only way to, in fact, even approach what is proverbially referred to as Neurath's boat, to be able to remend, reconstruct, reconfigure, and save the very ship that we have built ourselves in as we sail ever further onto this ocean of uncertainty and control is to reclaim the power of our own sapience, not only as a lens to abide ourselves objectively, but as a mirror to look upon ourselves subjectively, not fall victim to the folly of Icarus hubris, false pride, not only in what we create and what we control, but in our ability to manipulate, understand, and have insight and judgment to what we may make, what we may make of ourselves. It demands going forward in a balanced, reflective, reflexive, and responsible way. Issues such as the brand new brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies initiative that is launched by President Obama just in spring of this year are certainly innovative and will in fact address and confront the final frontier of the brain mind and what it means to be human and perhaps other species that are sentient, painient, and sapient. The question is, what will we do with that which we know and that which we can create? What will we do about that which we can't? And it's that sense of responsibility and self-awareness and reflexivity that I hold as the viable tool that is not magical, but that is in fact real, that we have possessed and possess evermore. And in fact, as we look into the looking glass, that looking glass allows us to then appear back upon ourselves and perhaps our most salient and perhaps our most significant strength is that sapience of self to guide and govern the demiurge that is not bioscience, but is bioscience and biotechnology as human endeavor 
inhuman endeavor and was created by us, humanity, the demiurge. So what I offer you in conclusion and in preparation for those experts, my colleagues who you'll hear momentarily, is this. We are both demiurge and Atlas. The future is in our hands and upon our shoulders. Let's not drop it. Thank you.